This is the last section of the cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Kingdom of Childhood. These are the questions and answers which were uh, worked on uh, at Torquay the next day on August 20th, 1924. Question. What is the real difference between multiplication and division in this method of teaching? Or should there be no difference at all in the first school year? And there's a footnote. The questions were handed to Dr. Steiner in writing. End of footnote. The question probably arises from my statement that in multiplication the so-called multiplicand one factor and the product are given and the other factor has to be found. Of course, this really gives what is usually regarded as division. If we do not keep too strictly to words, then on the same basis we can consider division as follows. We can say, if a whole is divided in a certain way, what is the amount of the part? And you have only another conception of the same thing as in the question, by what must a number be multiplied in order to get a certain other number? Thus, if our question refers to dividing into parts, we have to do with a division. But if we regard it from the standpoint of, quote, how many times, close quote, then we are dealing with a multiplication. And it is precisely the inner relationship in thought that exists between multiplication and division that here appears most clearly. But we should point out quite early on to the children that they can think of division in two ways. One is that which I have just indicated. Here we examine how large each part is if we separate a whole into a definite number of parts. Here I proceed from the whole to find the part. That is one kind of division. In the other kind of division, I start from the part and find out how often the part is contained in the whole. Then the division is not a separation into parts, but a measurement. The child should be taught this difference between separation into parts and measurement as soon as possible, but without using pedantic terminology. Then division and multiplication will soon cease to be something in the nature of merely formal calculation, as it very often is, and will become connected with life. So in the first school years, it is really only in the method of expression that you can make a difference between multiplication and division. But you must be sure to point out that this difference is fundamentally much smaller than the difference between subtraction and addition. It is very important that the children should learn such things. Thus, we cannot say that no difference at all should be made between multiplication and division in the first school years, but it should be done in the way I have just indicated. Question. At what age and in what manner should we make the transition from the concrete to the abstract in arithmetic? At first, one should endeavor to keep entirely to the concrete in arithmetic, and above all avoid abstractions before the child comes to the turning point in the ninth and tenth years. Up to this time, keep to the concrete as far as possible, by connecting everything directly with life. When we have done that for two or two and a half years, and have really seen to it that calculations are not made with abstract numbers, but with concrete facts presented in the form of sums, then we shall see that the transition from the concrete to the abstract in arithmetic is extraordinarily easy. For in this method of dealing with numbers, they become so alive in the child that one can easily pass on to the abstract treatment of addition, subtraction, and so on. It will be a question, then, of postponing the transition from the concrete to the abstract as far as possible, until the time between the ninth and tenth years of which I have spoken. One thing that can help you in this transition from the abstract to the concrete is just that kind of arithmetic that one uses most in real life, namely the spending of money. And here you are more favorably placed than we are on the continent, for there we have the decimal system for everything. Here, with your money, you still have a more pleasing system than this. I hope you find it so, because then you have a right and healthy feeling for it. The soundest, most healthy basis for a money system is that it should be as concrete as possible. Here you still count according to the twelve and twenty system, which we have already, quote-unquote, outgrown, as they say, on the continent. 
I expect you already have the decimal system for measurement? Parenthesis, the answer was given that we do not use it for everyday purposes, but only in silent science. Close parenthesis. Well, here too you have the more pleasant system of measures. These are things that really keep everything to the concrete. Only in notation do you have the decimal system. What is the basis of this decimal system? It is based on the fact that originally we had a natural measurement. I have told you that number is not formed by the head, but by the whole body. The head only reflects number, and is na- it is natural that we should actually have ten or twenty at the highest as numbers. Now, we have the number ten in particular because we have ten fingers. The only numbers we write are from one to ten. After that, we begin once more to treat the numbers themselves as concrete things. Let us just write, for example, two donkeys. Here the donkey is the concrete thing and the two is the number. I might just as well say two dogs, but if you write twenty, that is nothing more than two times ten. Here the ten is treated as a concrete thing. And so our system of numeration rests upon the fact that when the thing becomes too involved and we no longer see it clearly, then we begin to treat the number itself as something concrete and then make it abstract again. We should make no progress in calculation unless we treated the number itself, no matter what it is, as a concrete thing and afterward made it abstract. One hundred is really only ten times ten. Now whether I have ten times ten and treat it as one hundred or whether I have ten times ten dogs, it is really the same. In one case the dogs and in the other the ten is the concrete thing. The real secret of calculation is that the number itself is treated as something concrete. And if you think this out, you will find that a transition also takes place in life itself. We speak of two twelves, two dozen, in exactly the same way as we speak of two tens. Only we have no alternative like dozen for the ten, because the decimal system has been conceived under the influence of abstraction. All other systems still have much more concrete conceptions of a quantity. A dozen, a shilling. How much is a shilling? Here in England a shilling is twelve pennies. But in my childhood we had a shilling that was divided into thirty units, but not monetary units. In the village where I lived for a long time, there were houses along the village street on both sides of the way. There were walnut trees everywhere in front of the houses, and in the autumn the boys knocked down the nuts and stored them for the winter. And when they came to school they would boast about it. One would say, I've got five shillings already, and another, I have ten shillings of nuts. They were speaking of concrete things. A shilling always meant thirty nuts. The farmer's only concern was to gather the nuts early, before all the trees were already stripped. A nut shilling, we used to say, that was a unit. To sell these units was a right. It was done quite openly. And so, by using these numbers with concrete things, one dozen, two dozen, one pair, two pair, and so on, the transition from the concrete to the abstract can be made. We do not say four gloves, but two pairs of gloves, not four shoes, but two pairs of shoes. Using this method, we can make the transition from concrete to abstract as a gradual preparation for the time between the ninth and tenth years when abstract number as such can be presented. <clears throat> Question. When and how should drawing be taught? With regard to the teaching of drawing, it is really a question of viewing the matter artistically. You must remember that drawing is a sort of untruth. What does drawing mean? It means representing something by lines. But in the real world there is no such thing as a line. In the real world there is, for example, the sea. It is represented by color, green. Above all, excuse me, above it is the sky, also represented by color, blue. If these colors are brought together, you have the sea below and the sky above, and there's a sketch. The line forms itself at the boundary between the two colors. To say that here, horizontal line, the sky is bounded by the sea is really a very abstract statement. So, from the artistic point of view, one feels that the reality should be represented in color, or else, if you like, in light and shade. What is actually there when I draw a face? Does such a thing as this really exist? And the outline of a face is drawn. 
Is there anything of that sort? Nothing of the kind exists at all. What does exist is this, and there's a shaded drawing. There are certain shades in light and shade, and out of these a face appears. To bring lines into it and form a face from them is really an untruth. There is no such thing as this. An artistic feeling will prompt you to work out what is really there out of black and white or color. Lines will then appear of themselves. Only when one traces the boundaries that arise in the light and shade or in the color do the drawing lines appear. Therefore instruction in drawing must, in any case, not start from drawing itself, but from painting, working in color or in light and shade. And the teaching of drawing as such is only of real value when it is carried out in full awareness that it gives us nothing real. A great amount of mischief has been wrought in our whole method of thinking by the importance attached to drawing. From this has arisen all that we find in optics, for example, where people are eternally drawing lines that are supposed to be rays of light. Where can we really find these rays of light? They are nowhere to be found. What you have in reality is pictures. You make a hole in the wall. The sun shines through it and on a screen an image is formed. The rays can perhaps be seen, if at all, in the particles of dust in the room, and the dustier the room, the more you can see of them. But what is usually drawn as lines in this connection is only imagined. Everything really that is drawn has been thought out, and it is only when you begin to teach the children something like perspective, in which you already have to do with the abstract method of explanation, that you can begin to represent aligning and sighting by lines. But the worst thing you can do is to teach the child to draw a horse or a dog with lines. He should take a paintbrush and make a painting of the dog, but never a drawing. The outline of the dog does not exist at all. Where is it? It is, of course, produced of itself, if we put on paper what is really there. We are now finding that not only children, but also teachers would like to join our school. There may well be many teachers who would be glad to teach in the Walter School because they would like it better there. I have had quite a number of people come to me recently and describe how they have been prepared for the teaching profession in the training colleges. The teachers of history, languages, and so on are slightly shocking, but worst of all are the drawing teachers, for they are carrying on a craft that has no connection whatever with artistic feeling. Such feeling simply does not exist. And the result is, I am mentioning no names so I can speak freely, that one can scarcely converse with the drawing teachers. They are such dried up, such unhuman people. They have no idea at all of reality. By taking up drawing as a profession, they have lost touch with all reality. It is terrible to try to talk to them, quite apart from the fact that they want to teach drawing in the Waldorf School, where we have not introduced drawing at all. But the mentality of these people who carry on the unreal craft of drawing is also quite remarkable, and they have no moisture on the tongue. Their tongues are quite dry. It is tragic to see what these drawing teachers gradually turn into, simply because of having to do something that is completely unreal. I will therefore answer this question by saying that wherever possible you should start from painting and not from drawing. That is the important thing. I will explain this matter more clearly, so that there will be no misunderstanding. You might otherwise think I had something personal against drawing teachers. I would like to put it thus. Here is a group of children. I show them that the sun is shining in from this side. The sun falls upon something and makes all kinds of light. And there's a sketch. Light is shed upon everything. I can see bright patches. It is because the sun is shining in that I can see the bright patches everywhere. But above them I see no bright patches, only darkness. But I also see darkness here, below the bright patches. There will perhaps be just a little light here. Then I look at something that, when the light falls on it like this, looks greenish in color, and here under the black shadow it is also greenish, and there are other curious things to be seen in between the two. Here the light does not go right in. You see, I have spoken of light and shadow, and of how there is something here on which the light does not impinge. And lo, I have made a tree. I have only spoken about light and color, and I have made a tree. 
We cannot really paint the tree. We can only bring in light and shade and green, or a little yellow if you like, if the fruit happens to be lovely apples. But we must speak of color and light and shade, and so indeed we shall be speaking only of what is really there, color, light, and shade. Drawing should only be done in geometry and all that is connected with it. There we have to do with lines, something that is worked out in thought. But realities, concrete realities, must not be drawn with a pen. A tree, for example, must be evolved out of light and shade and out of the colors. For this is the reality of life itself. Footnote. The sketch was made on the blackboard with colored chalks, but it has only been possible to reproduce it in black and white. End of footnote. It would be barbarous if an orthodox drawing teacher came and had this tree, which we have drawn here in shaded color, copied in lines. In reality there are just light patches and dark patches. Nature does that. If lines were drawn here it would be an untruth. Question. Should the direct method, without translation, be used even for Latin and Greek? In this respect, a special ex exception must be made regarding Latin and Greek. It is not necessary to connect these directly with practical life, for they are no longer alive, and we have them only as dead languages. Now, Greek and Latin, for Greek should actually precede Latin in teaching, can be taught only when the children are somewhat older and therefore the translation method for these languages is, in a certain way, fully justified. There is no question of our conversing in Latin and Greek. Our aim is to understand the ancient authors, and so we use these languages, first and foremost, for the purposes of translation, and thus we do not use the same methods for teaching Latin and Greek that we use with living languages. Now, once more, comes the question that is put to me whenever I am anywhere in England where education is being discussed. Question. How should instruction in gymnastics be carried out? And should sports be taught in an English school, hockey and cricket, for example? And if so, in what way? It is emphatically not the aim of the Walter School method to suppress these things. They have their place, simply because they play a great part in English life, and the children should grow up into life. Only please do not fall prey to the illusion that there is any other meaning in it than this, namely that we ought not to make children strangers to their world. It is an error to believe that sports are of tremendous value in development. They are not of great value in development. Their only value is as a fashion dear to the English people. But we must not make the children strangers to the world by exclusion from all popular activities. You like sports in England, so the children should be introduced to sports. One should not meet with Philistine opposition what may possibly be Philistine itself. Regarding, quote, how, should, how it should really be taught, close quote, there is very little indeed to be said. For in these things it is really more or less so that the child imitates what someone does first and to devise special artificial methods here would be something scarcely appropriate to the subject. In drill or gymnastics, one simply learns from anatomy and physiology in what position any limb of the organism must be placed to serve the agility of the body. It is a question of really having a sense for what makes the organism skilled, light and supple. And when one has this sense, one has then simply to demonstrate. Suppose you have a horizontal bar, it is customary to perform all kinds of exercises on the bar, except the most valuable one of all, which consists in hanging on to the bar, hooked on like this, then swinging sideways, and then grasping the bar further up, then swinging back, then grasping the bar again. There is no jumping, but you hang from the bar, fly through the air, make the various movements, grasp the bar thus and thus, and so an alternation in the shape and position of the muscles of the arms is produced that actually has a healthy effect upon the whole body. You must study which inner movements of the muscles have a healthy effect on the organism, so that you will know what movements to teach. Then you have only to do the exercises in front of the children, for the method consists simply in this preliminary demonstration. Footnote. 
A method of gymnastic teaching on the lines indicated above was subsequently worked out by Fritz Graf Bottmer, teacher of gymnastics at the Waldorf School in Stuttgart. Question. How should religious instruction be given at the different ages? As I always speak from the standpoint of practical life, I have to say that the Waldorf School method is a method of education and is not meant to bring into the school a philosophy of life or anything sectarian. Therefore, I can only speak of what lives within the Waldorf School principle itself. It was comparatively easy for us in Württemberg, where the laws of education were still quite liberal. When the Waldorf School was established, we were really shown great consideration by the authorities. It was even possible for me to insist that I myself should appoint the teachers, without regard to their having passed any state examination or not. I do not mean that everyone who has passed a state examination is unsuitable as a teacher. I would not say that. But still, I could see nothing in a state examination that would necessarily qualify a person to become a teacher in the Waldorf School. And in this respect, things have really always gone quite well. But one thing was necessary when we were establishing the school, And that was for us definitely to take this standpoint. We have a method school, in quotes. We do not interfere with social life as it is at present. But through anthroposophy we find the best method of teaching and the school is purely a method school. Therefore I arranged from the outset that religious instruction should not be included in our school syllabus, but that Catholic religious teaching should be delegated to the Catholic priest and the Protestant teaching to the pastor, and so on. In the first few years, most of our scholars came from a factory, the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Factory, and among them we have many dissenting children, children whose parents were of no religion. But our educational conscience, of course, demanded that a certain kind of religious instruction should be given them also. We therefore arranged a free religious teaching for these children, and for this we have a special method. In these free religious lessons, we first of all teach gratitude in the contemplation of everything in nature. Whereas in the telling of legends and myths we simply relate what things do, stones, plants, and so on, here in the religion lessons we lead the children to perceive the divine in all things. So we begin with a kind of, quote, religious naturalism, close quote, shall I say, in a form suited to the children. Again, the children cannot be brought to an understanding of the Gospels before the time between the ninth and tenth years of which I have spoken. Only then can we proceed to a consideration of the Gospels in the religion lessons, going on later to the Old Testament. Up to this time, we can only introduce the children to a kind of nature religion in its general aspect, and for this we have our own method. Then we should go on to the Gospels, but not before the ninth or tenth year, and only much later, between the twelfth and thirteenth years, should we proceed to the Old Testament. Footnote. This paragraph can easily be misunderstood unless two other aspects of the education are kept in mind. Firstly, here Dr. Steiner is only speaking of the content of the actual religion lessons. In the class teaching, all children are introduced to the stories of the Old Testament. Secondly, quite apart from the religion lessons, the festivals of the year are celebrated with all children in a Rudolf Steiner school, in forms adapted to their ages. Christmas takes a very special place and is prepared for throughout Advent by carol singing, the daily opening of a star window in the Advent calendar, and the lighting of candles on the Advent wreath hung in the classroom. At the end of the Christmas term the teachers perform traditional nativity plays as their gift to the children. All this is in the nature of an experience for the children, inspired by feeling and the Christmas mood. Later in the religion lessons, on the basis of this experience, they can be brought to a more conscious knowledge and understanding of the Gospels. End of footnote. This, then, is how you should think of the free religion lessons. We are not concerned with the Catholic and Protestant instruction. We must leave that to the Catholic and Protestant pastors. Also, every Sunday, we have a special form of service for those who attend the free religion lessons. A service is performed and forms of worship are provided for children of different ages. What is done at these services has shown its results in practical life during the course of the years. 
It contributes in a very special way to the deepening of religious feeling and awakens a mood of great devotion to, in the hearts of the children. We allow the parents to attend these services, and it has become evident that this free religious teaching truly brings new life to Christianity, and there is real Christianity in the Waldorf School, because through this naturalistic religion during the early years, the children are gradually led to an understanding of the Christ mystery when they reach the higher classes. Our free religion lesson classes have indeed gradually become full to overflowing. We have all kinds of children coming into them from the Protestant pastor or the Catholic priest, but we make no propaganda for it. It is difficult to find sufficient religion teachers, and therefore it is a great burden when many children come. Neither do we wish the school to acquire the reputation of being an anthroposophical school of a sectarian kind. We do not want that at all. Only our educational conscience has constrained us to introduce this free religion teaching. But children turn away from the Catholic and Protestant teaching and more and more come over to us and want to have the free religion teaching. They like it better. It is not our fault that they leave their other teachers. But as I have said, the principle of the whole thing was that religious instruction should be given to begin with by the various pastors. When you ask, then, what kind of religious teaching we have, I can only speak of what our own free religion teaching is, as I have just described it. Question. Should French and German be taught from the beginning in an English school? If the children come to a kindergarten class at five or six years old, should they also have language lessons? As to whether French and German should be taught from the beginning in an English school, I should first like to say that I think this must be settled entirely on grounds of expediency. If you simply find that life makes it necessary to teach these languages, you must teach them. We have introduced French and English into the Waldorf School, because with French there is much to be learned from the inner quality of the language not found elsewhere, namely a certain feeling for rhetoric, which it, which it is very good to acquire. And English is taught because it is a universal world language and will become so more and more. Now, I would not wish to decide categorically whether French and German should be taught in an English school, but you must be guided by the circumstances of life. It is not at all so important which language is chosen as that foreign language, as that foreign languages are actually taught in the school. And if children of four or five do already come to school, which should not really be the case, it would then be good to do languages with them also. It would be right for this age. Some kind of language teaching can be given even before the age of the change of teeth, but it should only be taught as a proper lesson after this change. If you have a kindergarten class for the little children, it would be quite right to include the teaching of languages, but all other school subject, subjects should be postponed as far as possible until after the change of teeth. I would like to express, in conclusion, what you will readily appreciate, namely that I am deeply grat gratified that you are taking such an active interest in making the Waldorf School method fruitful here in England, and that you are working with such energy for the establishment of a school here based on anthroposophy. And I should like to express the hope that you may succeed in making use of what you are able to learn from our training courses in Stuttgart, from what you have heard at various other courses in England, and finally from what I have been able to give you here in a more aphoristic way, in order to establish a really good school here on anthroposophical lines. You must remember how much depends upon the success of the first attempt. If it does not succeed, a great deal is lost, for all else will be judged by the first attempt and indeed very much depends on how your first project is launched. From it the world must take notice that the initiative is neither something that is steeped in abstract, dilettante plans of school reform, nor anything amateur, but something that arises out of a conception of the real being of humanity, and is now to be brought to bear on the art of education. And it is indeed the very civilization of today, which is now moving through such critical times, that calls us to undertake this task, along with many others. In conclusion, I should like to give you my best thoughts on your path, the path that is to lead to the founding of a school here based on anthroposophy. And that is the end of the book, The Kingdom of Childhood by Rudolf Steiner.